Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about this new series that we're doing, Assembly Require. Now, this series is about relationships and talking about relationship and preaching on relationship is probably one of my top favorite things to do. I love engaging with people about their relationship. Now, there's going to be something in this message for you. It doesn't matter if you've been in a long-term relationship, in a short-term relationship, or you're thinking about getting into a relationship. There's going to be something in this message for you. So stay tuned. We're about to take this thing to the next level. So if you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I got some people on stage with me today. Say, I'm ready, y'all. I'm ready. And if you're ready online, I would just want you to put in the comments, say, I'm ready, Pastor. Say, I'm ready. All right, here we go. We're going to be looking at Matthew, the 37th, 22nd chapter, 37 through the 40th verse. I'm actually I I would rather start with the 34th verse saying, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We're about to jump into part one of this series, Assembly Required. And I just wanna talk to you from this subject before you do before you do. Now I'm gonna ask you to be as present as you possibly can. The greatest gift that you can ever give yourself is to be present. So do whatever you got to do, get your coffee, get your tea, sit down, move around in your chair, tell people to be quiet because this thing is going to be for you. If you wanna take your relationship to the next place, if you're looking to get into a relationship and you wanna make sure you're prepared before you get there, be present before you do. Now, this is a hot topic because no matter what season you are in, we still need to maintain service and establish our relationships. And sometimes your season will expose areas in your relationships that need the most attention. We can see from the book of Genesis from the very beginning that relationships are at the pinnacle of God's concern for our lives. Because here's the deal. The quality of our life is directly connected to the quality of our relationships. I'll say that again. The quality of our life is directly connected to the quality of our relationships. In other words, the people who occupy space in my life can either make it advantageous or aggravating. So I want to open this series with this axiom that it is God's intention that his creation engages in relationships that are fruitful, prosperous, and fulfilling. Let me say that again. It is God's intention that his creation engages in relationships that are fruitful, prosperous, and fulfilling. Here's the deal. Great relationships don't just happen. They require your attention, your care, and your intentional participation. Great relationships require your intentional participation. God's promises require your intentional participation. In the book of Joshua, before the children of Israel are going into Canaan, while God said, and he already promised that the land was theirs, he required them to put in some work to make sure that they get it. He said, he didn't just say, I'm going to give it to you. He says, if you, then you will get. But you've got to put yourself to work. So he puts his armies together and he puts his praises together and he puts people together to make sure the very thing that I said is yours, you got to go get it in order to claim it. So in order for you to occupy, in order for you to get what God has called, in order for you to get what God has promised in your life, you've got to put some work into play. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Woo! Okay, I'm just making sure we're on the on the same page here to have the relationship that God has for you. You must first have some proper instructions, say instructions, say instructions online, instructions, God's principles 
for relationships. Everybody knows that a great architect, a designer, a builder, an artist, and before you begin to build anything, you've got to have a blueprint. You've got to know what is the example. You have to set the standard for what it is I'm supposed to be doing. So God creates a blueprint for us. In other words, God says, before you put it together, you've got to get it together. Most of us, most people jump too far and too fast into relationships and they and when they fail, they blame the failure on the issues in the relationships and not on the lack of the preparation and the principles. We spend way too much time trying to get our relationships to look like the Instagram post. And we forget that there are some foundational principles that must be established before we get to see the glory of God in our relationships. You don't get God's promises without going God's route. Proverbs 14 and 12 says there's a way. There's a way that appears right, but it leads to destruction. You don't get God's promises by doing it your way. You don't get God's promises by trying to figure it out. God has already given us the instructions. So before you say I do, before you say let's go on a date, before you text that guy back, before you send another text, before you call them back, before you tell your friends how cute he was or how fine she is, check the blueprint. Check the basic instruction before leaving Earth. First, you need to check if your life aligns with the proper principles of relationship. Principles, 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 a fundamental truth that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior. Principle. God has established certain principles and standards that we understand so we'll know how to move forward and how to get to the next level that God wants us to. Remember what we said before, that God's intention for all of his creation is to have relationships that are fruitful, that are prosperous, that are fulfilling, that are growing. Because everything you do will be affected by your principles. Everything you do will be affected affected by your system of belief. Everything you do will be affected by your foundation. This is why right here in Matthew, right here in Matthew, Jesus establishes what real and successful relationships are supposed to look like in every way with just these couple verses. He says two things. And I want to back up so we can read this just a little bit. Matthew 22. And then the 34th verse, I'm going to look at the 34th verse because I think this is funny. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. Think about this. Just prior to this, Jesus has just had a conversation with the Sadducees and he embarrassed them. So now another group of religious leaders, now that they've heard that he's embarrassed them. Now they want to roll up on Jesus and see, now what do you have to say to us? So here's what I think about that, because the devil will always try you when you pose your standards. Whenever you say that this is who I am and this is what I stand for, Satan will always come and try to trick you and try you and see, do you really stand for that? Is that really what you believe? So. Here's this Pharisee comes to Jesus just to trick him. And he's a lawyer, so he knows his stuff. He's a lawyer, so he's, he's, he knows his Bible. He knows his testament. He knows this truth. And he asked him, and the Bible says, testing him. See, trying to try. See, the devil, ooh, the devil is going to try you. He's testing him. He tested him, and he says, teacher. Which is the greatest commandment of the law? And I love that Jesus doesn't lean in. He knows he's being tested, but Jesus doesn't really lean into the test. Jesus answer his, answers his question in a way that he cannot even foresee. He messes up his whole theology in just a couple words. This is what I love. Jesus comes back to him and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
and with all your mind. What do I do before I do? What is the principle that Jesus is establishing here as it relates to relationships? That before you do anything, you have to make sure you have the right principle. And that first principle is love God. Don't just kind of love God. Jesus goes through the series. He says, I want you to love God with all your heart, with all your mind and with all your soul. Love the Lord with all with everything you have shows up in the Bible over 540 times, which means loving God is something important. It is something that's principal in your life. It is consequential to your relationship success that you've got to love God first. Love the Lord, not with just some of, not with just pieces of, but love the Lord with all of your heart, all. He says, I want you to love me with the innermost part of your being, the part we use to receive contact from God. I want you to love me as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to love me in your spirit. I want you to love me in the place where we have fellowship. I want you to love me in your mind. I want you to love me with your emotions. I want you to love me with your will. I want you to love me with the psychological part. I want you to love me with all of it. I want you to love me with the physical part. I want you to love me with your hands and your feet and your eyes and your elbows and your knees and your toes and your shoulders. I want you to love me with everything you got. I want you to love me. I want you to love me with your decisions and your choices and your prayer life and your actions. And I want you to love me intelligently. Your love for God will affect every decision you make, especially your relationships. What do you do before you do? What do you do before you call them back? What do you do before you text them? Before you've got to take a survey of your life and say, do I really love God? Because all of my decisions will be based on how I feel about God. Your love for God will create the standards by which you allow people to occupy time and space in your life. If I'm loving God right, then my decisions won't be based on my feelings, but they will be guided by my allegiance, by my devotion and by my commitment to Jesus Christ. Before you do, before you do anything, put God at the center of your decisions before you do. This is why I love Matthew 6 and 33. Again, this is Jesus talking. Woo! I love it when Jesus talking again. This is Jesus talking. And he Jesus says, seek first his kingdom. And his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. All these things will be given to you. I love that on the heels of this in the 32nd verse, Jesus is actually saying People are looking for something. They need deliverance. They need healing. They need stuff. They're looking for food and they're looking to be taken care of. And Jesus is going, hey, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things will be added to you. Because here's the deal. You get what you seek. You get what you seek. If your principles are wrong, then you will seek wrong then what you get will be wrong. Seeking his kingdom means you are giving up your will for his. It does not mean that God does not care about what you desire, but God knows what you want better than you know what you want. And he knows how to walk what you need right in front of you. But if you're not seeking the right thing, you won't see what God has for you when he brings it around. Let me help you with that one. Let me say that again. It does not mean that God does not care about your desires, but God knows what you want better than you know what you want. And he knows how to walk what you need right in front of you. But if you're not seeking right, you won't see what God has for you. In Genesis, in the second chapter, God creates Adam. And we're going to talk about that in a second. 
But as we move forward in the book of Genesis, we say, see that God actually puts Adam to sleep and he pulls a rib out from his side and he creates woman. And the Bible said he presents Eve to Adam, which means that God has given Adam the ability to choose if Eve is what he wants. And then when we see from there, it is Adam who establishes, oh, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Oh, she's fine. She's all that and then some. Do y'all see her? She is better than an Instagram post. No filter. She is all that and everything else I could ever even imagine. But Adam would not have chosen her if Adam didn't have the right relationship with God. Because Adam could have said, no, God, I'm good. I'll wait for the next thing. I'll wait for something better. But because Adam was in right relationship with God, Adam knew that when God brought the right thing in front of him, Adam knew how to pick right because Adam was seeking right. Woo! If you don't seek right, you won't get right. So here's what loving God helps you do. We're going to look at the book of Genesis. Oh, yeah. Genesis, the second chapter. Genesis 2 and 26. Actually, Genesis 1 and 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Loving God right helps you accept your identity. See, if you don't love God right, you won't even know who you are. God says you are made in his image and in his likeness. That means that you are not an accident. That means that you are not an incident. That means that you are not a mistake. That means that you are chosen, that you are loved, that you are formed in his image, that you are special, that you are unique, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are on purpose for purpose. That means that God loves you, that God actually formed you with his hands and he did it for a reason and a purpose. That helps you understand your identity. When you can see, when your relationship with God is right and you're loving God first before you love you first, then you have the right identity in yourself. Then nobody else can give you low self-esteem. The reason my esteem is so high is because I know who I am and I know whose I am. I am a child of the king. I am the head and not the tail. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am God's son. Loving God helps you accept your place. Ooh, say place. It helps you accept the place. In Genesis 2 and 8, it says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Mm. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man before he had formed. This is place. God placed Adam in the garden. God, not only did he create him and give him identity, then he placed him. He placed him where he wanted him to be. He placed him in a specific place. He placed him somewhere where he was going to be. Uh, uh, he was going to get the best out of that place. Sometimes we, we try to jump into relationships and we try to jump out of the place because we don't like the place that God has put us in. Stop fighting the place. You are in that place for a reason. You didn't just fall out of the sky into Topeka, Kansas. God placed you there. You didn't just show up in Northern California. God placed you there. Stop trying to leave the place that God put you in. God put you in that place for a reason and for a season. So while you're in that place, why don't you do what God wants you to do in the place that you're in and flourish and prosper and fulfill and multiply in the place that you're in? Because God put you in the place. Loving God helps you accept 
your purpose. When we look, go down to the 15th verse in, in the second chapter, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. So not only does God give you a place, not only does he give you identity, he then also gives you purpose. God gives you purpose. I know we, we live in a society that says follow your dreams. And, and I've even said it from time to time. Follow your dreams and follow your passion. But the truth is God doesn't want us chasing our dreams. He wants us chasing our purpose. He wants us to chase what he's called us to do. See, dreams are something that you want to do. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong. It doesn't mean that God doesn't honor them. But purpose is something that you've been designed for. Purpose is, is something that God said before you were formed in your mother's womb. I chose you. I picked you. I gave you something to do. I created a purpose for you. And so while God has you in the place, he also has a purpose for you. And I know some people might be thinking right now, yeah, but this job that I'm working, it don't feel like my purpose. This, this, this thing that I'm doing right now doesn't feel like my purpose. Well, here's the reality. Your job might not be your purpose, but your purpose might be at your job. So stop fighting where you are and start loving God right so that you can start to realize and illuminate, God, is, is this where you have me? God, how, how do I resource where you have me? How do I serve where you have me right now? And so long before somebody comes to sweep you off your feet, listen to where God has purpose in your life. Next, lastly, God will give you parameters. This all is before you do. God will give you parameters. He puts them in a garden and he says, this tree, leave this tree alone. This is, this is one of the most amazing things that God gives us because he gives us choice. He lets us choose. He gives us parameters and because the reality is if, if you start touching things and doing things that the designer didn't have in mind for you, it will inevitably create problems. And so God knows your parameters. And so if I love him right, then I respect the parameters because my love for him understand that he knows better for me than I know for me. And so when he says, don't touch the stove. Then I don't touch the stove. Because I understand him. I, I may not get all the stuff. I may not understand it intellectually, but I do understand that his ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. And he can see the landscape from a bird's eye view that I would never be able to see. He can see into the future and he can see into the past. He can see my innermost being and he can understand things about me that I will never understand about me. So when he says I've, I've created parameters, he's not putting restrictions on me. He's not actually putting chains on me. He's actually saying, do you choose to love me? Do you choose to love me? Do you choose to love me the right way? First, you got to love God. This is why Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. Then he says, what is equal to the first commandment? What is equal, which is just like the other one, is to love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love someone else the right way if you have not first learned to love God and love yourself the right way. If the prerequisite for loving your neighbor right is loving you right. Love your neighbor as yourself. I can't love you right. I can't love you right if I don't love me right. And I can't love me right if I don't love him right. See, he's setting the principle. He's setting the standard up before you get into these relationships, before y'all you you break up and you all crying and sad and listening to the sad music. Before that ever happens, before you have relationship fails, before we ever get to that point, he says, love me because I got you. Love me. And now I'm going to show you how to love you. And then you're going to know how to love somebody else. 
We cannot expect to have success when we continue to do relationships our own way and not God's way. We do it backwards. <laughs> we jump into relationships and then say, oh, God bless this. We, ju we jump into these relationships and go, oh, she fine. Oh, he fine. Oh, she's got a good job. Oh, he knows how to cook. We jump into the re relationship based on our personal preferences. And then we are soon quickly or even over time disappointed because we didn't do it God's way. And remember what I said in the beginning. It is God's intention that his creation engages in relationships that are fruitful, prosperous and fulfilling. But we wouldn't be able to do that if God didn't give us the instructions and show us how to do it. And he does so right here. Well, pastor, I'm already in a relationship. What do I do? I'm in a relationship now. And the before you do still applies to you. Let me jump back here. If you're single and you're thinking about getting a relationship and just so we understand what single is. If you are not married, you are single. If you are divorced, you are single. If it's complicated, you are single. If y'all go together, you are single. If they don't know y'all go together, you are single. Before you do, you have to ask yourself the question, am I making my decisions about my relationships with God at the center? Survey your own relationships, survey your surroundings, check the blueprint. Don't make decisions out of fear or convenience or insecurity. Make them based on what the Bible says, the basic instructions. Once you check your relationship through God's standards, you'll know if God is calling you to step up or step out. You'll know what God is calling you to pursue. I'm going to sometime real close here in the near future, I'm going to be preaching a, a, a message on relationship superpowers. I believe that everybody that's pursuing a relationship or in a relationship should have some relational superpowers. And one of those superpowers is the power to walk away. You've got to have some real superpower strength to walk away from something that you know that God has not called you to. I'm talking to my single people. I'm talking to my single people that you've been with somebody for two, three, four years and you can't figure out a way to get out. And you know that that's not what God has called you to. I'm talking to my people who, who God has been chomping you in your ear. The Holy Spirit has been whispering to you. You can't even sleep at night knowing that you're not supposed to be in that relationship. You know, you know, everybody can see it except for you. Everybody's told it and you've got to have some supernatural relationship superpowers to walk away. You need the power to walk away. We're going to talk about that later. But no matter where you fall on the spectrum of relationships, I guarantee that if you're willing to follow his plans and use his principles, you will experience his promises and his joy in your life. Amen.